Welcome to the Gilded Age and Progressive Era, a podcast about the United States and the world in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. I'm your host, Michael Patrick Cullinane. Welcome to a special episode of the Gilded Age and Progressive Era. In addition to the regularly scheduled podcast, today's show has invited Professor Clive Webb to share some of his research in a reading. But this is no ordinary reading and no ordinary research. It's the story of great fraud and deceit, of a diplomatic imbroglio between the United States and Canada, and involving one of the most feared capitalists of his time, Jay Gould. Joining us today is Clive Webb. He's professor of modern American history at the University of Sussex in the UK, and he's one of the foremost scholars on race in the American South. His first book, called Fight Against Fear, explores the role that Jewish communities played in the African-American freedom struggle. He's since published extensively on a number of other subjects, including the far right in Southern, Southern politics, the forgotten dead, which is what he terms Mexican victims of mob violence, and recently he's published several several articles about race in an Anglo-American context, including some exciting work on lynching and the idea of American exceptionalism. So you'll have to stay tuned for that and Clive's other ongoing research, which is about violence committed against foreigners in the United States. Today, though, the story that Clive will read is originally one that ran in Canada's history in the December 2021, January 2022 issue. You can purchase that magazine online at canadashistory.ca, and I'll leave a link to that in the show notes. I'm grateful to Canada's History for allowing us to share with listeners this story, and I'm so pleased that Clive agreed to narrate the story of The Laird on the Lamb. In 1873, Canada and the United States almost went to war, all because of a man who did not exist. That March, a Scottish nobleman named Lord Gordon Gordon negotiated a deal to a bet American business magnate Jay Gould in gaining control of the New York-based Erie Railway Company, for which he received one million dollars in cash and company shares. Gould, however, had fallen for a con. The supposed aristocrat turned out to be a hustler who cashed in the stocks and eventually fled to Manitoba. When Gould pursued him, this private matter escalated into a diplomatic confrontation that seriously tested Canadian border security and national sovereignty. The 19th century was the golden age of the con artist on both sides of the border between Canada and the United States. Among the rogues gallery of grifters, hustlers and welchers were a number of Canadians, most famously Cassie Chadwick, who from the late 1890s defrauded US banks of millions of dollars when she pretended to be the illegitimate daughter and heiress of industrialist Andrew Carnegie. Only Gordon Gordon, however, incited a diplomatic incident between Canada and the United States that necessitated intervention at the highest level of each country's government. He was, in the words of journalist William Crawford, one of the most audacious and plausible swindlers and robbers that have taken the highway since Dick Turpin. Tall and slightly built, Gordon Gordon certainly gave the appearance of a Scottish laird. Draped in tartan fineries, he sported elaborate side whiskers and manicured hands that suggested a man accustomed to high living rather than hard labour. Adding to the illusion was his lilting brogue and gentlemanly deportment. All very impressive for a man later rumoured to be the illegitimate child of a clergyman's son and parlour maid. Gordon Gordon launched his audacious criminal career in Edinburgh, Scotland during the late 1860s. Presenting himself as Lord Glencairn, He ingratiated his way into the homes of affluent families 
and used their names as references to purchase jewellery on credit from numerous businesses, both in Edinburgh and in London. Having accumulated tens of thousands of pounds worth of goods, he promptly disappeared. Changing his alias from Glen Cairn to Gordon Gordon, the bogus aristocrat reappeared in 1871 on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean, in Minneapolis. Advertising himself with a large deposit in a local bank, he announced his intention to purchase land for a settlement of Scottish noblemen. Representatives of the Northern Pacific Railroad courted him for months in the hope of persuading him to acquire some surplus land it owned. According to one newspaper account, railroad executives hired a French chef who catered to Gordon Gordon's every whim, serving him potted grouse, cranberry jelly and more champagne. Having wined and dined out of their pockets, however, Gordon Gordon staged a second disappearing act. He rematerialized in New York City in January 1872. Checking into the exclusive Metropolitan Hotel, he once more cultivated friendships with wealthy and influential figures. This included former New York Tribune editor and presidential candidate Horace Greeley, who arranged the fateful introduction to Jay Gould. Gould was one of the richest men in the United States, and also one of the most despised. He was an archetypal robber baron, one of the industrial magnates who, in their unscrupulous pursuit of wealth, sought monopolistic control over key sectors of the US economy. Ruthless speculation in the expanding railroad system allowed Gould to amass a fortune estimated at around 77 million US dollars, around $2 billion today, by the time of his death in 1892. His deviousness was evident between 1866 and 1868 when he connived with Daniel Drew and James Fisk in a struggle against Cornelius Vanderbilt for control of the Erie Railway, which traversed New York State. Drew, Fisk, Gould and Vanderbilt all owned shares in the Erie Railway Company. Vanderbilt sought to take control of the company by buying up more than half the stock from other shareholders. In response, Gould and his associates issued watered-down stock in the company that they offered for sale at a price higher than its actual value. Vanderbilt, determined to secure his business takeover, rashly purchased the overpriced stock at a loss of more than $7 million. This enormous financial loss and his ultimate failure to purchase a controlling interest forced him to cede control of the company to Fisk and his allies. Only a year later, in September 1869, Gould precipitated a panic on Wall Street when he attempted to manipulate the gold market. Acting once more in cahoots with Fisk, Gould bought up huge amounts of gold in order to increase its value so that it could then be sold for the highest possible profit. The scheme relied on bribing federal officials to withhold the sale of government gold reserves, which would have increased market supply and lowered the escalating price. However, when US President Ulysses Grant learned of the ruse, he ordered the immediate selling of $4 million in government gold. The resulting drop in the price of gold led to the events of Black Friday, a financial panic on September the 24th, 1869, that ruined many investors. Having sold his gold before the market collapsed, Gould emerged unscathed. The master manipulator of the market was, however, about to become the victim of a massive fraud. Gordon Gordon persuaded Gould that he owned $30 million of stock in the Erie Railway and had control 
of a further $20 million in the possession of fellow Scottish aristocrats. Sensing the opportunity to further consolidate his control of the railway, Gould offered Gordon Gordon a bribe of $1 million in cash and securities in return for him using his influence as a large investor to affect the outcome of the forthcoming election of board directors. Having played Gould for a sucker, Gordon Gordon immediately sold a large part of the securities. Realising he'd been conned, the railroad magnate sued to recover his losses. He also persuaded New York authorities to bring a criminal fraud charge against his nemesis. Gordon Gordon was arrested, but used the influence he still possessed to raise the $37,000 needed to post bail. The legal fight between the two men that began in May 1872 was a protracted farce. Gordon Gordon countersued, failed at first to turn up in court, and then, while lawyers futilely chased after the fake character references he produced in his defence, promptly absconded. The Scottish swindler resurfaced in October 1872 at Fort Gary in Manitoba. When Gould learned of Gordon Gordon's whereabouts, he tried to persuade Canadian authorities to arrest him, but failed. However, after one of the people who had posted bail for Gordon Gordon in New York died, his family liaised with the mayor of Minneapolis, George Brackett, to go after the fraudster. Brackett's chief of police, Michael Hoy, accepted the assignment along with Sergeant Owen Keegan. Along with two co-conspirators, they devised a plan to sneak into Canada, kidnap Gordon Gordon, and smuggle him back into the United States in order to recover the bail money. As the fake Lord hid out in Fort Garry and the vigilantes plotted his abduction, a private dispute over money was about to become part of the broader ongoing dispute over border relations between Canada and the United States. The border had long been a source of instability and conflict. The Webster-Ashburton Treaty of August 1842 was intended to facilitate cooperation in cross-border law enforcement by providing for the extradition of fugitives accused of murder or assault with intent to commit murder, or piracy, or arson, or robbery, or forgery, or the utterance of forged paper. Local authorities, however, at times proved reluctant, or, in the case of fugitive slaves who fled from the United States to Canada, openly unwilling to comply with extradition orders. Further disputes occurred during the US Civil War when Confederate soldiers, spies, and saboteurs established a covert network across several Canadian cities, including Halifax, Montreal, and Toronto. They staged a number of cross-border raids, including an October 1864 bank heist in St. Albans, Vermont. Canadian authorities arrested the marauders and returned the recovered money. However, a court ruled that the extradition of the soldiers would violate Canadian neutrality and ordered their release, arousing fury in the United States. It may be said that this will lead to a war with England, asserted the New York Times. So it may. But if it must come, let it come. Caution eventually prevailed, but for a time there was a threat that Canada would be the battleground for a new war between Britain and the United States. In the years immediately following Confederation, policing the border was a problem because of its sheer size. On November the 19th, 1869, the Hudson's Bay Company ceded control of Rupert's land, an enormous territory of almost 8 million square kilometers to the British Crown. Following the suppression of the Red River resistance, 
The Crown in turn handed control to Canada on July the 15th, 1870. After British Columbia joined Confederation in 1871, the border between Canada and the United States stretched more than 8,000 kilometers from coast to coast. Maintaining its integrity became even more of an issue with the departure of the British garrison from Canada in 1871. The incursions of American criminals across the border caused continued difficulties for the newly formed Dominion of Canada. Smuggling, counterfeiting and kidnapping threatened the creation and maintenance of law and order. One episode that inflamed a furious response from Canadians occurred almost simultaneously with the attempted kidnapping of Gordon Gordon. On June the 1st, 1873, drunken wolf hunters who had crossed the border from Fort Benton in Montana Territory launched an assault on an Assiniboine camp in the Cypress Hills of what is now southwestern Saskatchewan. The attackers killed at least 23 men, women and children, mutilating their bodies in what local Indian agent Major A.J. Simmons described as a most outrageous and disgusting manner. None of the victims was responsible for the theft of the murderous horses, the alleged crime the wolf hunters were claiming to avenge. Efforts by Canadian authorities to bring the murderers to justice ended in failure. The incident was instrumental in the creation of the North West Mounted Police in 1873. Newly appointed Assistant Commissioner James MacLeod received authorization from both sides of the border to pursue an investigation in Montana Territory. But his attempt to secure the detention and extradition of the hunters led to MacLeod himself being charged with false arrest by local authorities. When Canadian authorities later apprehended three of the suspects who crossed back over the border into Canada, the US State Department stonewalled their trial on the grounds that Americans who gave evidence would have no immunity from being arrested and prosecuted. The Crown's case collapsed and the accused men walked free. It was against the backdrop of these events that on July the 2nd, 1873, the two American vigilantes, Hoy and Keegan, carried out their plot to kidnap Gordon Gordon. They seized him in Fort Garry, bound his hands and feet, and bundled him into a covered wagon. The phony aristocrat, bearing wounds he claimed his captors had inflicted, later told Fort Garry officials how he turned round and demanded by what authority they did this and wanted to see their papers. Hoy said he would give me papers enough if I did not shut up. Before the kidnappers could reach the border, however, the Northwest Mounted Police apprehended them. They also arrested their two accomplices, George Merriman and Lauren Fletcher, the latter a prominent member of the Minnesota State Legislature. Judge Charles McGinney of the Manitoba Court of Queen's Bench granted bail to Merriman, but denied it to the other conspirators. Thus, two American officers of the law and an elected state representative were set to face in trial in Canada for kidnapping. Reaction across the border was divided. In New York State, the Rochester Federal Union concluded that the abductors knew they were acting outside the law because they had made no attempt to apply to Canadian authorities for assistance. To those who protested the arrest and detainment of the American vigilantes, the newspaper cautioned that had it been Canadians who crossed into the United States to kidnap a fugitive, indignation would be heard throughout the land. Other newspapers were more critical of the Canadian legal system. Although the Minnesotan Chatfield Democrat had little sympathy for what it described as 
the avaricious, avaricious adventurers who attempted to abduct Gordon Gordon. It also anticipated that American vigilantes might seek what it referred to as a little fun against the Manitoba greasers. The use of this phrase in the Democrat and other newspapers articulated the antipathy that some Americans near the border felt towards their northern neighbours. A greaser was more commonly a term of racial invective directed against Mexicans. Its meaning as a term of abuse for Canadians is unclear, but it could have been meant to indicate the supposed corruption of the Canadian criminal justice system. The journalist William Crawford, for instance, made the unsubstantiated claim that Manitoba Attorney General Henry Clark had offered to release the prisoners in return for Minneapolis Mayor Brackett buying a plot of land he owned for $14,500. Whatever the truth, some Minnesotans were evidently willing to retaliate against what they perceived as an act of provocation by Canadian authorities. On July the 8th, 1873, a placard appeared outside the office of St. Paul's Minnesota Pioneer. It read, 1,000 recruits wanted for immediate service in Manitoba. At first, this appeared to be little more than a bit of mischief. According to one newspaper report, the Hoy Avengers, as it described them, would each receive 90 rounds of ammunition and a canteen of brown ale. Yet, according to the Minneapolis Daily Tribune, many faces which in the morning wore broad grins were lengthened as the day grew shorter, as the promised ale and ammo failed to appear. Tensions continued to escalate. Fletcher, the Minnesota state representative, became ill and feared he would die in his prison cell. A telegram sent on his behalf beseeched Minnesota authorities to take action. Come quick, I'm in a hell of a fix. The message had its intended effect. If Fletcher and the rest of the boys are not released by next week, announced the Wilmar Republican, the United States shall proceed to declare war. Minnesota Governor Horace Austin then warned that if Manitoba authorities refused to release the prisoners, the consequences, in his words, would be deplorable. Manitobans reacted with righteous anger to the threats to their provincial and national sovereignty. The Manitoba Free Press declared that it had no more regard for Gordon Gordon than newspapers across the border, but unlike them, it still believed he was entitled to the full protection of the law. By contrast, the appeals to the mob made by Minnesota newspapers, in its words, gave credence to the wildest reports we have heard of American disregard for law, international and otherwise. The free press was furious that US newspapers should portray the newly created province of Manitoba as a lawless frontier. It warned Americans, don't poke fun at us, for in this case at least, you must see that the laugh is not all on your side. These were not idle warnings. Manitoba Attorney General Clark urged officials at the Department of Justice in Ottawa to demand that Washington recall US Consul James Wicks Taylor from an office he believed he had disgraced by inciting the vengeance of Minnesotans. Articulating national rivalries Clark proclaimed that in appealing to the passions of the mob, Taylor was, as he put it, doing something that may be tolerated in the United States, but which cannot be allowed here. Given the background of cross-border tensions, it's understandable how a small spark such as the arrest of Gordon Gordon's kidnappers could threaten to ignite the flames of military conflict. However, Diplomacy eventually prevailed over war. Governor Austin and Mayor Brackett travelled to Washington, D.C. for an audience with President Grant and Secretary of State, 
Hamilton Fish. This in turn led to a meeting in Ottawa with Prime Minister John A. Macdonald. The result of these negotiations was that in September 1873, the prisoners who had been held in custody pending trial each received a cursory one-day sentence before being released. In response to a request from Manitoban authorities for over $5,900 to cover the costs of the American kidnappers' trial, which had necessitated convening an additional session of the Court of Queen's Bench, the Canadian government deemed this very exorbitant and far in excess of accounts rendered for similar services in other parts of the Dominion. The Department of Justice offered instead the reduced sum of $3,950. While the kidnappers were now free, so too was Gordon Gordon. For almost a year, he continued his life of leisure in Manitoba. His criminal career, however, was about to reach a dramatic end. In 1874, a Toronto magistrate issued two warrants for Gordon Gordon's arrest. The persistent railway baron Jay Gould had tracked down Marshall and Sons, one of the Edinburgh jewellers defrauded years before by the conman. A representative of the firm had travelled to Toronto, where, on the basis of photographic evidence, he had identified Lord Glen Cairn and Gordon Gordon as the same man. The magistrate authorised warrants for his arrest on charges of obtaining goods under false pretenses and bringing stolen goods into Canada. Alexander Munro of the Toronto Police tracked down Gordon Gordon to a cottage in Headingley, a small community west of Winnipeg. On August 1st, 1874, Munro woke the con artist from his sleep, only to see Gordon Gordon reach abruptly for a revolver. I made a rush towards him to prevent his shooting Monroe later testified at an inquest. I expected it was meant for myself, and as I was about getting hold of him, the shot went off. Gordon Gordon had not aimed the gun at the police officer, but instead pointed it at his own head. According to the physician who examined him, the bullet went straight into the brain, just above the right ear. Monroe leaned close to hear the dying man's last words, but he could not catch their meaning. The life and career of one of the most audacious con artists of the 19th century had come to a sudden, shocking conclusion. Gordon Gordon's suicide did not, however, resolve the problem of policing the US-Canadian border. Although the case led to greater collaboration between officials to arrest criminals who crossed from one country to the other, illegal activities including smuggling and robbery continued to cause friction. So too did the migration of indigenous people who resisted the division of their ancestral homelands. In 1883, the United States proposed an agreement for the pursuit of indigenous people across the border but Canadian authorities declined. As for Gordon Gordon, police examining his corpse found only 37 cents in the pockets of the supposed millionaire. To this day, the real identity of the ersatz aristocrat remains unknown. <laughs>